Hello, good morning. Welcome to Joy News Desk. Coming up, GPRT is expected to announce an increase in transport first later today. But passengers say price hike will affect their personal budgets. Ten cities as uh, transportation for a child. You also have to give this, and it, it, will, it is also affecting you too. So you are paying. Nearly 500,000 Ghanaians are hear, hearing impaired. We'll bring you a special uh, report on the hearing impaired mother who is struggling to raise her daughter. If a person is born deaf already, being deaf alone has its own mental health implications on the individual. There are some deaf people who get all the support that they want. Other deaf people don't have that. Also in this bulletin, a Sikuma Odobing Brakwa District Assembly describes the multimedia group classroom project as a huge relief to the district. If we were taking the entire project to execute, we would understand how much it was going to cost the assembly. And so if a team had taken that upon themselves and the little commitment that we need to give to support that, I think it's in good cause. We have all of this plus many more coming up within the next hour. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. This is your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. Please stay for details. Let's start with the coalition of transport operators that is pushing for a 30% increase in transport fares following the recent fuel hikes at the pump. The drivers say they have been compelled to propose an increment in transport fares because the government has not scrapped some taxes to cushion fuel increase. The drivers are expected to meet the government today and announce an increase in fares. But ahead of that, passengers say any increment in fares will affect their personal budget. They spoke with Joy News. Okay, so definitely it's going to affect us because technically this year, most of us, our salaries were increased. So we are operating with the same budget. So 30%. It's on the higher side and definitely is going to affect us. So we will plead with the government if the other taxes on it, which can be taken out for us to be cushioned a little bit, could be done. It could help us a lot. Walk at this time before they join the bus. Maybe if he's going to Kaneshi, some of them will manage to walk from here to Awudume. If he sees that he's tired, then from there he will take their car. Some of them also buy bicycles for their children who are schooling. And other old people who are working as securities, they also manage to buy bicycles because the cost of transportation is too expensive. And looking at their salaries, it doesn't help them. So people find so many ways to come to work and live as well. So it affects our work. And our children are also schooling as well. So if you give 10 cities as uh, transportation for your child, you also have to give me 15 cities or 20 cities. And it, it, it is also affecting you too. So you are appealing to the government to do something about the fuel price. Instead of increasing the transportation fares, I think something should be done about the fuel prices. I don't support it, because at first, if, if we were paying one CD, we would pay one CD 30 pesos, and that would affect us so many, so many, so much. It will affect us so much. So cost of goods, items will also increase, and it will affect everybody. So I don't support it at all. Eh, eba sa na na ma di tono aba from chere so mo see lor mo join lorry fare no ho adie no ho kura na so pe so on ta because of lorry fare nti on to me nto e bi o be why any budget ni na o be do eh station ni e be ka say at lorry fare so say ni say ni say na adie wo so o tono on to me nto ti e wo sa ma yeso ye ya de ton for no ye won chire ye Mora Basu speaks for the GPRT you has been explaining why this proposal and if you remember, in the budget presentation, government said starting from 1st July 2022, uh, all government activities will go up by 15 percent. We considered all the orders involving GVLA, permit, etc., etc. We considered all these, and we arrived at 30 percent of what adjustment in law effect. But by then, we are aware. Government has no stay in the oil marketing companies buying. They are slow abiding as we are. We did not stay 
is taking effect on Monday, that we are presenting that to government on Monday. This is what we said. I think somebody has misquoted the decision taken at the meeting. So everybody should exercise patience. Yes, we've considered the passengers as well who are our relatives, hence arriving at that 30%. So this is the situation in which we are. We are aware government has withdrew the subsidies in fuel since 2015. But by then, we always want to be law abiding. Let's give government the opportunity by presenting our grievances to government on Monday, that is tomorrow. And we will for this time round, we have decided not to wait till about two months as we did last year in the upward adjustment that thirteen percent. But we strongly believe the presentation would have government think back immediately. So this is the standard we took. Well, but Imoro, you know, there is a disjoint here. You're presenting your case to government on Monday. In that very same vein, we're having, you know, your sister coalition also increase prices by 30%. How do you balance this inconsistency? That, 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 that is the coalition. I'm also speaking as well as a spokesperson for coalition as well. Fortunately, I was part of the committee who were giving the work. We were all there. We were all with this, and we never said that from Monday the 13 percent should start to make. That wasn't what the coalition presented. That was why I said someone among us might have misinterpreted or mispresent what we said at the meeting at the police. You have the uh, uh, Mora Bats who speak uh, for the GPRT on why they're proposing a 30% increment on FERS. Now, let's move on to other stories. Depression and anxiety are common among people with hearing impairment. This is according to a 2019 Oxford University study. Nearly 500,000 Ghanaians are hearing impaired by the latest population and housing census. But a lack of attention for many of them means some endure a life of pain with little or no help in critical times as childbirth. In the following report, my colleague Jasses Beda shines light on the life of a mother with hearing impairment and her journey to bring up her daughter. When Esther Kofi found out that she was pregnant, she says her heart skipped a beat. As a woman with hearing impairment in a country with little or no support for people of her like, life was already tough. There's a lot of, you know, hearing people who refused to accept me as a deaf person. Thanks to her family, her delivery and parenting has not been as rough. But not all deaf mothers are this lucky. Some people think that, uh, you know, deaf people can take care of their kids. Actually, we, we can and we do our best. I like her a lot. She's really smart. And um, she, um, she actually got to know that her parents are deaf, you know, very early. Example, when we go out, you know, when I go out with her, and we are in the car. She doesn't talk with me, you know, like speaking. She, she signs with me when we are in the car because she knows that her mom is deaf. Teachers were even calling me Mumuni. It got to a point when you come to my school and you mention my name, nobody knew me until you say Mumuni before everybody would know, oh yes, this is the guy, you know, you are looking for. It was that bad. Jonathan in Team Dakun grew up in Kofoidia. His mother and father were both deaf. Today he works with the Ghana Association for the Deaf and he is the one who has brought me to meet Esther and to help me interpret what she wants to say. If a person is born deaf already, being deaf alone has its own mental health implications on the individual. There are some deaf people who get all the support that they want. Other deaf people don't have that. They don't have the support. Nobody's helping them. Nobody, you know, they are neglected. Look at what that alone can do to a person. So if that person happens to be a mother, 
then they end up treating you know it it, 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 it also has some kind of effect on the child because then they end up treating the child in a certain way that we would say it's not right. A 2019 Oxford University study showed deaf adults have a higher reported rate of diagnosis of depression or anxiety disorder. The Ghana Health Service does not have sign language interpreters in many health facilities across the country. Deaf women go into labor many times under doctors who do not know how to communicate with them. Antenatal and postnatal centers largely do not have sign language interpreters. And there is almost no one to talk to about their mental health post delivery. In Ghana, too, uh, even you know, normal people who have mental health are not even able to access healthcare because of what discrimination and how, how people will talk about them. How much more a deaf person? They don't, they don't even know that there's a place where they can even go to get that assistance. I'm not God to, to know what her future will be, but what is, uh, I want to do is that I want to work so hard to give her the best education that she, she needs, to give her every needs that she wants. Maybe when she grows up, she's of age and she wants to be a doctor, I'm ready to support her to become what she wants to become. I'm ready to encourage her to learn hard, to make her parents proud. Compared to her friends, Esther has been lucky. But in a country where care for deaf people is almost non-existent, many deaf mothers are going through a dark, lonely journey of caring for their children. Justice Beidou, Joy News, Ebri. We can now go back to our earlier story of uh, a, a imminent increase in fuel prices by 30 percent and uh, we are joined by Godfred Abubri who is General Secretary of the GPRTU to tell us more on this. Uh, Ms. Abubri, I'm grateful for your time this morning. What exactly has necessitated this uh, proposal for a 30 percent increase in uh, fares? Yeah. Good morning, Asha. But I think uh, the first correction is that we have not indicated that we are increasing first by 30%. You, you so. said it's a proposal, right? It is not even a proposal. We have said that the factors, we went out and did a survey, and the survey has to do with the fuel prices, okay. the lubricant prices, the sudden increments on the number of spare parts, and the increment on the fees, all oh, these are all the components that we normally consider their adjustments and then factor them in and to arrive at how much we can uh, adjust our, our fare. So in that survey when we did, we have got all of them combined about some 35% increase. But that doesn't translate that we are equally going to increase fares by 30 or 35%. No. All right, These are so the component, total of the components that are, uh, are the determining factors of the uh, running cost of commercial cars. Mm. Yeah. So you have a meeting today, right? With that yes, point? please. We have a meeting with the Trust Minister. Okay. Submitted uh, uh, the report on this, our survey, to the, for them to consider. So today that we have been called to meet and then do further discussions on that, that uh, document. What, what are your expectations of this meeting as you go into the meeting? What time even are you going for this meeting? Well, our, our expectations suggest that we are just going to do a negotiation as to by what margin are we going to accept and increase our fare? By what margin that we are going to agree and then to uh, uh, do effect on our fare? So, yes, you've, indi not. you've indicated that uh, you are asking for 30%. That means that you should be able to defend it when you get to this meeting uh, at the table with the transport minister. What will be your biggest argument at this meeting? Uh, you have just quoted me wrongly. I didn't say we have indicated that we are asking for 30%. I didn't say that. I said the fact test increase. One thing is that when you do the survey, 
and then you get about 30% adjustment or increments in total. It doesn't mean that you are going to increase first by 30%. Yeah, you are proposing. Yes. Okay. So I'm asking, what kind of arguments are you going to put up to ensure that you get what exactly you want? Yes, even, even if, for now, we will get there. Our discussion should be centered on, even if we are going to give you the free hand. Oh, I think uh, by your calculation, you know, it's worth it. So go and increase your friends by 30%. All operators will not go and make such a mistake. Because the system as we are now, coupled with the COVID, still there's kind of a, a serious drawbacks. And then the passenger turnout per day is affecting our business. That's why this time around, we are acting in a different manner by being reluctant in the hastily increasing phase. So what we think we are going there is just to ask for the margin that we can increase and still put ourselves in business. I'm going to put ourselves in business. Mm. So, so you, this is a proposal for now, 30%. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, exactly the margin you are looking for? Well, so, I, I, it's not what we are looking for. We think that even though they ask us to see by what time. What margin do you think we will increase and then uh, all of us will... Uh, That's what you, you want to ask the minister to tell you how, I mean, how much percent you should charge. Is that what you're saying? No, we want you to be aware of the level of... But now, if they are looking at only the four components, we have given them additional areas where there are factors that affect our business. You see, we don't normally look at the four components alone. That's why the need for us to do this kind of survey and then to add up the rest for them to see. Mm. So what time are you meeting the minister? Three o'clock today, please. Th three o'clock. All right. I'm grateful for your time, uh, Mr. Godfred Abubri. He is the General Secretary of the JPRTU. Let's move on to other stories. The Bono East Regional Director of the National Road Safety Authority, Emmanuel Echampon-Pari, has been mourned the number of people killed through road traffic accidents involving motorcycles. The region, by statistics available to the NRSA, recorded a total of 288 accidents, which resulted in 129 deaths, out of which 85, representing 65.9%, died through motor accidents, a situation authorities described as worrying. Correspondent Anna Sabit has more. Road traffic accidents remain a major public health and development challenge in Ghana. They are amongst the top 10 causes of deaths, draining over 2.5% of Ghana's gross domestic products annually. In the Bono East region, a total of 288 road accident cases involving 537 vehicles were recorded in the year 2021. The region recorded 129 deaths out of which 85 persons, representing 65.9%, died through motorcycle accidents. Emmanuel Achampampari is in charge of the Bono East Regional Road Safety Commission. So in 2021, in the Bono East region, this was the road traffic crash case in the region. That's the situation that happened in the region last year. 288 cases were recorded and out of that, 537 people were involved. And somebody will ask, why is it that the cases are 288, but the crashes, the vehicles involved are more? It is because in a crash, they can, it can involve two or more vehicles. That's why the cases are more. Then we have 65 pedestrian knockdowns, 65 pedestrian and then out of that, 129 people lost their lives. And as I said, 85 people died as a result of using motorbike or motorbike knockdown. So that's it. Then we had 383 injuries. 383 people were injured. And as the injuries, some cannot work again. They are permanently uh, injured and they cannot do anything again. Uh, he attributed the increasing number of deaths recorded through motor accidents to the neglect to road traffic regulations by motor users. It's as a result of uh, a human, a bad human behavior. Uh, they don't comply with the motorbikes, they don't comply with uh, the road traffic rules. And also, these days, there are influx of motorbikes. People are buying the motorbikes more into the system. So, definitely, 
the more the motorbikes, the more the motorbike accident. And also, the motorbikes, they are supposed to take uh, the one with the two tires. They are supposed to carry only two passengers, uh, the person riding and the pillion rider, the person behind. If it is Prague, yeah, it's all to take three or more, not more than four. But here is the case, people are uh, people carry more than two people on one motorbikes. And even when you look at the Prague, people overload, especially school children, they overload them into the Prague while they are going to school. So when something happens, so instead of expecting maybe two, because it's a motorbike, expecting two, then you end up uh, recording more deaths or fatalities. Yeah. He however noted that the commission is lazing up with other stakeholders to intensify education and sensitization as well as increase enforcement on our rules to reduce the numbers. Well, National Safety Authority in the Bono East region and the nation as a whole, we are doing our best to curb the road traffic uh, crash in the country. Uh, so we still continue to do our intensive education. Uh, we don't do education only during Christmas. We do education from 1st January to 31st December. So we still control with the education and also we release with the police MTTD to tighten the enforcement exercises. So this time there should be more prosecutions. When people are prosecuted, then they will, do, they will know they have to do the right thing. So we have to enhance the enforcement uh, operations in the region and the country as a whole. Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Tichiman. And in Accra, in the studio, my name is Aisha Ibrahim. So to come on News Desk, Asikuma, or the Bing Brapa District Assembly, describes the multimedia group's classroom project as a huge relief to the district. If we were taking the entire project to execute, you would understand how much it was going to cost the assembly. And so if a team had taken that upon themselves and the little commitment that we need to give to support that, I think is in good course. There is more shortly after this break. Welcome back to News Desk. The Esikuma Odobing Brakwa District Assembly has described the classroom project as a huge relief to the district in terms of educational infrastructure. District Chief Executive Lawrence Edutua Esiao acknowledged that the project has come to fill the gap created by a bigger project which had stalled, pledging his commitment towards timely completion. Mr. Edutua Esiao commended the multimedia group for selecting his district as a beneficiary of the classroom project. MFA Atiamo Eli has more. Fulfillment of the Assembly's commitment to the successful completion of the three-unit classroom block for the Brima Chamra GA Busy School, the Esukuma Odobin Brakwa District Chief Executive Lawrence Edutia Esiong personally exported eight tracks of sand to the construction site to fill the foundation. He organized an excavator to move to site the trips of flat tracks required for the hydrophone block production. Expressing the district's excitement about the ongoing project, Mr. Edutia Esiong revealed how he got wing of the project. I think the first day I heard about this, I was on radio <laughs> and I saw a test message that, hey, your district is being discussed on Asempa. And I, I was confused then, but I concluded that it, maybe it's for a good cause. And uh, I've seen the results. For the DCE, the classroom project is filling a critical education infrastructure gap, which would have otherwise caused the assembly a lot more to be able to provide. If we were taking the entire project to execute, we would understand how much it was going to cost the assembly. And so if a team had taken that upon themselves and the little commitment that we need to give to support that, 
I think it's in good course. And so um, we will be committed to the project. Most importantly, look at the number of projects that we need to undertake. It's only by the grace of God when someone or a team, another team decides to intervene and then help us in their own small way. But specifically with <laughs> Jamra, we know the history. And I did not to repeat uh, what we wouldn't want to hear again. But there is a bigger project that uh, was started some time ago. I'm sure if that project had been completed, uh, I think uh, this issue wouldn't have really come up. And so we are aware we work so far what needs to be done. And so your team should be rest assured that we are not going to fail on our side, That's specifically what we need to do. So let's expect the best. And once again, I'm grateful. Senior news editor adjoins Fifi Kumsin, who led a team from the multimedia group to ascertain the progress of work on site, applauded the DCE for his support while reminding him the classroom project could be another solution to his quest to dealing with teacher attrition in the district. You're talking about attrition rates. Sometimes teachers are uncomfortable teaching in certain classroom blocks. It's a reason they may not even be teaching. Yeah, so. Uh, definitely, it also be an encouragement to some teachers to even do their work. And of course, to the children in the community who would not want to go to school because they fear their classroom will collapse on them. I am very excited and on behalf of the multimedia group, we want to thank you for your support. We hope that uh, within the next few days or weeks, this project will be Done. With the provision of sand, work on site has picked up once more. The DCE could not hold back his joy and appreciation to the multimedia group and its partners. Maybe I should add my voice in thanking all those who have been contributing because I see him almost every time trying to thank even those who are yet to contribute. <laughs> 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 so it will be, we are grateful to those supporting the multimedia in executive. I know it's not easy at all. Because sometimes you do the projections and expect a certain something that needs event. Even especially when the public know that, hey, what's this initiative? They may even think that probably uh, individuals have given everything that we've done. But in actual sense, it may not be as the people may think. So sometimes we understand. Yeah, possibly the hell that you might be going to, but our support is is the we are we are going to give out our best and so God bless the multimedia and <laughs> thank you for uh, so work so far. The classroom project is brought to you in partnership with the Star Ghana Foundation with funding from the Dutch Foreign Affairs Ministry. It is supported by the Israeli Embassy, the Forestry Commission, the Planned City Extension Project, DBS Roofing Sheets, as well as you, our cherished audiences. The Classroom Project, promoting social justice through philanthropy. Amufa Atiyamua Eli. For Joy News, Brima Jamra. You can also support the Classroom Project by sending your donations to MTN Momo number 05930-3883, 05930-388832. Or you may call our front desk for more information on how to give for change. Now to Parliament. Majority Leader Sechi Nensabunsa says most of the MPs captured on camera in the free-for-all fight in Parliament are found wanting during the debate in the chamber. The Swami MP who described the violent scenes as a dent on Ghana's democracy insisted that Parliament is a gathering of brain work and not display of bravado. He said this in the part two of the Joy News hotline documentary titled Ghana's Hung Parliament, A Blessing or a Curse, which will be aired tomorrow, Monday. It's aired actually today at 8.30 p.m. Here are assets. These are members of parliament, members of Ghana's parliament here. Now the third fight in the first year 
of the eighth panel. So this is the situation here on the 20th of December 2021. Well, I must also condemn it uh, because it's shameful. It's a dent on the image of Ghana's parliament to us in leadership that is occurring at our time. And we should bow down our heads in shame. It's a dent on the parliament of Ghana. And indeed, a mortal wound on Ghana's democracy. We got off to a bumpy start January 7th. And I saw some leaders attacking <laughs> ballot boxes. Some in leadership doing that. You saw. You saw some in the extended leadership booting down pulling boots. You saw that. And you saw somebody also snatch ballot box, uh, ballots and attempt to run away with it. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a shameful incident that day, what happened. And then December, these rowdy scenes, fisticuffs. And I saw some members, you know, attempt to slap their own colleagues. And he took pride in that. And such people, when it comes to discourse in the plenary, they are found wanting. Do you see them? And he thinks that he must exhibit bravado. Is it the display of bravado or brawn or brain in parliament? In parliament, it's about brain power, not the display of brawn. Professor Ransford Jampo, a political scientist, argues it's okay for MPs to fight. Listen to me, uh, every uh, hung parliament has got its own features. One of the key distinguishing features of every hung parliament is its susceptibility of degenerating into political fisticuffs. It is there. That is its nature. Okay, every hung parliament can degenerate into physical fight. It is there. But you see, in politics, countries that are determined to climb higher the ladder of democratic progression copy the best practices. You understand? So my point is that even though physicals are features of every hung parliament, there are parliaments that are hanged that do not um, show that features. They are mature. And so rather than looking at countries that have fisticuffs because they have hung parliament, let's look at other countries that have tolerance and that are able to dialogue and reach consensus with their hung parliament and copy them. Can I speak with Parker Wilson? He put together the documentary that airs today at 8.30 p.m. Parker, what should we expect in this part two of the hung parliament? Aisha, there are two key things we put a spotlight on in this part two of our documentary. Um, one, it's the conduct of the speaker in the eighth parliament that the speaker here is Alban Babin. And the majority leader in this documentary has been a number of concerns against the speaker, indicating that there's some kind of group solidarity with the NDC compost and the speaker. So the speaker appears to be more of an NDC speaker than presenting himself as a speaker of parliament. So that is one. And also, two, we are looking at why the NDC almost every time are the ones engaging or initiating the violence. You recall that on January 7, 2021, they were the ones kicking the ballot boxes, um, 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 taking the ballot box, uh, pushing away the polling booth and all of that. Again, if you fast forward to uh, the year 2020. Uh, one, the last year, December, uh, you remember that there was a national group who snatched the speaker's chair. Munta Kimura has been providing explanation as to why the NDC caucus in Parliament has been doing this over the year gone by. And the point he makes is that if you come to Parliament, if you allow things to go by, you cannot challenge it anywhere. And so they want to challenge it in the House. They can't take you to court when you allow Dwight to engage in, in his words, illegality or otherwise. And that is why you see them almost all the time being aggressive in the chamber. So 
these are the two key things we are interrogating in the part two of our documentary, uh, Ghana's Parliament, Ghana's Time Parliament, A Blessing All Cares. And was for Jumpo has an interesting perspective on who the speaker should be. He makes the point that every speaker has been partisan. So the NPP shouldn't expect anything different from Aban Babin. Aban Babin will be a partisan speaker, just like Michael Chris. So these are the things, very fascinating conversation in our documentary. And we expect every uh, Ghanaian to lock uh, their TV channels on Joy News this evening at 8.30 p.m. when we air the part three. And I must say, we'll be doing the part three as well. So, I mean, it's quite a lengthy com uh, a documentary. We'll make sure that we give every bit of it to our viewers who are watching Joy News. And also cover every angle. You heard there from Paka Wilson, who is a producer for that documentary. It's at 8.30 p.m. today. Make a date. Two other stories, COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy uh, being a real challenge amid all the rumors and disinformation about the vaccine. Uh, we're telling you about what health authorities in the Buna East region are doing. They are employing effective policy strategies capable of increasing the vaccine take-up rate across the region. Buna East Regional Minister Kwesie Dujan, who supported the health directorate, to launch a five-day COVID-19 national immunization campaign urged the people to help achieve the region's target of vaccinating 20% of its population within the next five days. And as Sabit has more. The Bono East Regional Health Directorate has launched a five-day national vaccination campaign as part of efforts to help increase the uptake of the COVID-19 vaccines. The region, which had a target of vaccinating over 700,000 people by the end of the year 2021, only had 16.7% of its targeted population fully vaccinated by the end of January this year. Bono East Regional Minister Kwesi Edujan attributed myths and misinformation as the major factors that led to the low patronage of the vaccines. Our targets for the December 2021 was 774,063 people were to be vaccinated. Out of this, by 27th January, only 16.7 had been fully vaccinated, meaning that in the Bono East region, we have 16.7% fully vaccinated. Ghana is set to get about $4 billion from the World Bank. We have details of this shortly in business. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Ghana is set to get about $4 billion from the World Bank to support the economy and the budget from next year. The funds will be spread over five years and could see about $700 million disbursed every year, but tied to key reforms. Pierre Laporte is World Bank Country Director. We are in discussion with the, with the Minister of Finance and... Uh, we, the door is open. We have, uh, we have on the table budget support ready for Ghana. But uh, as you know, budget support like IMF programs are based on setting strong reforms. Mm -hmm. So we are in discussion now with the government to what we hope can be a reasonably strong enough reform package that I can take to my board sometime, uh, sometime at the end of... Uh, this year or early next year. We, we are keen, we want to. Um, we, are dis we are in discussion with the government for and that. And that is a, a financial program for Ghana, right? Coming yeah, from the World Bank. Yeah, it will be a budget support from the World Bank, mm -hmm. yeah, besides the projects that we do. Mm -hmm. This will be basically cash support mm -hmm. to the budget. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but it doesn't come free. Mm -hmm. It comes with satisfying certain fundamental reforms that will have positive impact on the budget and on other sectors of the economy, like energy. Uh how much are we looking at here from the, from the bank? It can be anywhere two, three hundred million dollars we can talk about, yeah. Mm -hmm. and what total funding are we looking at under this uh, country partnership program? It's, uh, we're looking at uh, seven to eight hundred million dollars every year for Ghana in the next Over. five, six years. Yeah. 
let's say about over six years, uh, about over three, three point five to four billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, Group President for CAGL, a licensed radioactive transporting company, Isaac Amakumensa, has called on companies that transport radioactive and explosives to consider giving training to the various stakeholders and employees responsible for carrying out such activity. He spoke to Joy Business after a day's training for over 50 frontline security agencies in the radioactive chain in the Western region. Correspondent in Natalia Kwanza has more. Isaac Amwakomensa said the explosion at Apiate two weeks ago has become a wake-up call for the company to make sure that everyone along within their chain of work gets to know exactly what they are working with to handle them appropriately. Describing the explosion as a tragic accident, he said, radioactive source transporting companies must take a cue and start thinking of the impact that inadequate training and lack of knowledge by the workers can possibly bring. Mr. Isaac Moakumensa said the explosion at Apiate should be a call for all, including the CHEL, to intensify regulation and knowledge base on radioactive to enhance safety. This training is not meant for protection of yourself alone. It's meant for you to protect yourself, your neighbors, and the environment as a whole. Because you saw water being tested because of uh, the possibility of radioactive leakage, right? Mm -hmm. So everything is not just about me or you. It's about the whole community in which we live. A lot of people go out and if if it had been the radioactive incident that happened at Apiati, 100 years from now, or 200 years from now, would have still been living with the replications of that incident. So for me, this training has come in at a very timely uh, time that in future, when you are escorting, or you are doing a documentation, or you have to do an approval, you know exactly what to look out for before you do that approval. You know exactly what to look out for before you sit in that escort truck. You know exactly what to look out for before BNI, you tell them that, look, you can move this or you can move that. A senior resource scientist at the Radiation Protection Institute, Dr. Francis Otu, on his part said, though there are no ready statistics to back the impact of radioactive sources in the country, that of the lack of knowledge can go a long way to affect generations unborn. Hence, commended CAGL Group and asked other companies to emulate them. And I think uh, this is what the Institute is mandated to do, to make sure that it's training people that occupational exposed to radiation sources. And then what they have done is one of them, we're expecting that all the companies which their service involved with radiation exposure to be able to know the importance of training their workers. All right, and that's it for business. There's an invitation to the uh, national, by the National Labor Commission for UTAG to um, appear for their matter to be discussed. I will read excerpts of that letter for you. It says, uh, re-invitation to appear before National Labor Commission in the matter of strike by University Teachers Association of Ghana. And uh, please refer to the letter dated 3rd February 2022 of even reference on the above subject matter. Per letter dated 4th February uh, from the Council for UTAC, Dako Kelly, uh, the latter and company UTAC has declined attendance at the commission's meeting of today's date 7th February 2022 and it says in view of paragraph 2 above the National Labor Commission rise to advise all parties that the meeting is hereby cancelled and it's signed by Dr. Benis Welbeck Director of Administration and HR for Executive Secretary and that's how we wrap up news desk. We'll bring you more on this on news today. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Enjoy the rest of our programs.